Hello, and welcome to this week's My News Wrap, news from the world of SAP, Microsoft, and the world in between. And this week, there have been quite some news, especially from the area of Microsoft. So let's dive into the topics. Let's start, as usual, with the um, SAP area. So what do we have there? Um, one general announcement. Um, as I said, there was some carving out of the SAP financial service area um, into a joint venture with an investor called Datic. And there was some, some uh, announcement around that, that this will happen. And now there are some details how the company is called and it's called SAP Pioneer. So there's still SAP in the brand name, which is interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. Um, and there is also um, announcement of the leadership team that includes, well, if you're working in the area of financial services, the um, well-known folks from that area, like uh, De Cruze or Reiter Saga, um, that you probably know from there, and not, not a big surprise. So let's see what, what else will come out um, from that topic in the near future, because I think now things get, get rolling in the middle of the year, and let's see how things evolve there. Then let's go to the uh, business technology platform area. So there was um, one announcement about the um, business technology platform in the context of Rise with SAP. And there will be quite some um, live sessions coming up, or there is a series announced on, on live sessions about how those two things play together. Um, I think the first session will be about the integration suite and well, it will be about uh, presenting the, the updates and innovations about the, the different areas of um, the products that are living on the SAP Business Technology Platform. Um, it will be, well, it's announced to be uh, quite interactive with an open Q&A at the end, so, uh, and, and quite some demos. So it, at least from the, from the announcement, it will not just be a big slideshow. So that's highly appreciated. Then there is also the other format, which is called um, SAP Garage, um, where the first episode um, on May the 5th was done. Um, it focused on extending via the SAP Event Mesh. Um, there, there is a recap blog post that I referenced in the show notes, um, and there is also a reference to the um, recording that's available on YouTube. So you can watch it from there. Um, basically, from, from my perspective, um, this SAP Garage series is a, a walkthrough to the SAP Discovery Center missions, um, which um, is, is done on a regular basis. I think the schedule should be um, every month, um, with, which, which allow, gives you some guidance when, when you walk there through. However, if you do it yourself in the Discovery Center, I think it's basically the same. There is just missing the guidance. And there are some, some looks behind the curtains by the product experts of SAP. So that's kind of the additional value. Um, the next session is also already announced. You can register for that one. And it's about um, setting up your account, your, your, your account structure, which is quite important thing. Um, not super sexy like uh, event mesh, but um, really important if you start with SAP Business Technology Platform. Now, another blog post from the area of um, extending SAP with SAP Business Technology Platform um, came out this week about um, OAuth to some barrier assertion flows um, between SAP S4 HANA Cloud and SAP Business Technology Platform, especially the destination service in there. Um, and this blog post quite extensively describes what you have to do in order to make that uh, come true. It's quite quite good, quite some um, background information and then all the, the single steps and tasks that you have to execute when you want to um, configure this uh, communication scenario on SAP S4 Cloud um, and making use of the destination source. Now with that, I would like to switch to one, one highlight on the SAP side of this week um, in the area of the Cloud Application Programming Model. There is one blog post by Tobias Hoffmann, um, which describes on how to run a Cloud Application Programming Model 
with PostgreSQL in OpenShift. Um, and the, the most important point there is, I think this really shows the potential of the cloud application programming model. So the, currently a lot of, of blog posts focus on cloud application programming model, Cloud Foundry, HANA. Um, as, a, as Tobias also states, that's kind of not the scenario where you will get too much, where you get the, the biggest benefit out of it, let's put it that way, and where you will be super future-proof from my perspective. Um, because as you see, when you look at the community, Cloud Foundry is not the, the hottest shit on the planet Earth. So um, I think this really shows how, if SAP would finally open source cup, what you would be able to, to tackle with that stuff um, also in, in the non-SAP area. So that's that's really cool. And this blog post walks you through what's already possible now with the community contribution, uh, the PostgreSQL database connector, um, and running it on Kubernetes. And it's not just a, a plain hello world uh, thingy where you put everything in one pod and uh, hope that it works, but it's um, a more realistic scenario, um, which, which is putting the cat application in one pod, putting the PostgreSQL database in another pod, and also making use of uh, persistent volume claims so that you do not lose your data when the pod with the PostgreSQL um, vanishes, which can always be the case. Um, yeah, quite quite nice write up, quite uh, cool to see um, how easy it is to um, make things work with OpenShift on Kubernetes. So um, that's, that's really uh, nice. Yeah, with that, um, I have one last thing from the um, SAP area, um, and that's um, a blog post by Olga Dolinskaya, <clears throat> also in the context of RISE with SAP, and what you can expect from the uh, custom code migration in context of RISE with, RISE with SAP. So um, again, a quite extensive write-up, as usual by Olga, on what's contained, what you can, what can be done with the custom code migration app in the context of RISE with SAP. Um, if you are working in that area, absolutely worth reading. With that, I would like to switch to the um, Microsoft part of the house, as there are a lot of announcements this week. Um, first things first, the Azure icon got a new look. Um, it's, I think, not completely rolled out up to now, um, but the Azure icon was now um, transferred to the Fluent Design language that um, SAP is using. Uh, you have seen that with all your Microsoft 365 logos, and that now also kicked in in the Azure area. So if you're watching this video, this is how the new Azure product family icon now looks like. So hopefully a lot of new stickers will come out. Then another announcement um, around Microsoft uh, being leader in the Forrester wave of low-code development. Um, well, you, you can think about Forrester, Gardner, and so on whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's not the, the, the holy grail, but um, I think it gives a, a very good indication where um, there is the, the where there are the leaders in a certain area. Of course, there are some flaws in there, but at least it gives an indication on that. And as you can see, there is absolutely Microsoft is one of the biggest leaders. There is also Mendix in there, um, which you probably know from the SAP area, especially. And there are some other well, performers um, that, that are well known, like APN or, or Pega Systems. Now, what becomes quite clear when you take a look at the um, well, graphics that shows all the low code contributors, um, there is no app guy, for example, there's no room. So um, for SAP, I think it would make sense or it would make more sense to partner with the leaders uh, instead of playing catch up to them with some other solutions that might work, might not work, but that's my opinion. Um, then there is another announcement that came out by Microsoft this week, um, which is also quite important um, for all the folks who are working with Microsoft, be it 365, be it Dynamics, be it um, Azure, 
when it comes to um, data protection, data governance within the European Union. And there is one announcement of Microsoft that, that clearly shows their, their dedication to keep things in a, in a let's say, ordered state, uh, in a secure state with respect to the data that you store at Microsoft. Um, and that's about um, setting up a, a European Union data boundary um, for the Microsoft Cloud. So with this data boundary, Microsoft will make sure that all the data will definitely stay in the United States, uh, in, the, in the, pardon me, in the European Union. It will not go to the United States. That's the important point. And that also includes uh, uh, telemetric data. So um, with that, of course, um, there are still some gaps because of uh, legal restrictions. So as Microsoft is a company that is located in the United States, it is under US law. Um, so it, it's not everything now solved with respect to, to shrimp and, and uh, the Cloud Act and so on. But I think that's really a, a very good indication for European customer that Microsoft takes this topic serious. Then um, with that generic information about Microsoft and the announcements, let's switch to the biggest and coolest announcement that came out this week, and that's Azure Static Web Apps. Azure Static Web Apps is now GA. So as of May the 12th, Microsoft made this functionality on Azure generally available. And it's not just that the previous stuff went to GA, but there are a lot of things, a lot of new functionality that also came into Azure Static Web Apps. So you now have uh, two plans. You have a free tier and you have a paid tier. And within the paid tier, there is one, from my perspective, very important thing. Um, that's bring your own functions. So you can bring your own functions into Azure Static Web Apps and make use of them, uh, which is quite cool because within the free tier, there is, there is an Azure function environment, but that's managed by Microsoft and it has some restrictions. For example, you cannot use durable functions. For example, you have some restrictions with respect to languages, and that's now solved within the paid plan. And there, there, there are a lot of other super cool, cool uh, features in there um, that are now GA. There, I referenced the, the um, usual uh, announcement blog post. I referenced the blog post by the uh, principal um, product manager from Microsoft, which is a bit more extensive and, and tells you what, what's all contained, especially also the Azure Static Web's, Web Apps CLI. That's also super cool. Um, and it helps you really to do local development. And what I also referenced within the show notes, if you want to follow Azure Static Web Apps and keep up to date, they also have a Twitter handle um, that you uh, can follow. And this way you will always stay up to date with the latest and greatest on Azure Static Web Apps. Um, if you want to make your hands dirty, if you, if you want to start with Azure Static Web Apps, there is also one um, uh, GitHub repo that I would like to highlight by uh, developer advocate uh, Berg Holland of Microsoft, um, which showcases the um, way how you can build uh, a static web app um, and, and also highlights the um, options that you have with a local development and what's now easier since it's uh, um, GA uh, and also the CLI is in place and working. So that's from my perspective the yeah, coolest announcement that was made this week. So this is really hot stuff and take a look at it if you're working with Microsoft and even if you're not working with Microsoft. Um, then there is another blog post from the area of serverless that I would like to highlight um, about uh, durable entities. And this blog post uh, kind of um, wraps up durable entities signal R um, React, MobX, and, and TypeScript. Um, and it addresses one weak spot of durable entities when you do them with TypeScript, and that's you are restricted on how you model your durable entities. You can only model them in a functional way, not in a, in a real entity 
object-based way, actor-based way. Um, and this blog post shows you how you can overcome that and how you can really link a lot of things together there. Um, some statements uh, with respect to the Azure Static Web Apps are no longer true due to the um, uh, GA thingy that I just announced. So, um, but that's that's only minor stuff. All the rest is really quite interesting. And if you're working in that um, um, in that area with um, stateful serverless, I think that's absolutely um, worth reading this blog post and trying out. Then I also want to highlight two announcements from the area of Azure Storage, which might not be the um, latest and greatest stuff, but um, I think um, Azure Storage is one of the most powerful ingredients when it comes to um, um, working with Azure Functions, um, because they, they give you a lot of, of flexibility with respect to prop storage and so on. And there are two features that, that have been uh, pushed out this week, and that's one thing about or both are about security. One is general available, and that's about um, preventing shared key authorization for uh, um, Azure Storage. So up to now, you, you have the option to authenticate via Azure Active Directory or by um, using the access keys. And now you can switch off as a configuration the access via the um, access keys, and you have to authenticate via um, Azure Active Directory. And the second one is a preview announcement, and it's also super useful. It's um, attribute-based access control for Azure Storage, which gives you a lot of more um, options on how to um, define the, the access rights, <coughs> um, the, the role-based access definitions on your Azure Storage. So that, that's in preview, but um, that also, I think, comes in really handy. Um, then, um, another blog post from the area of Microsoft development, um, the, the cloud blog. I think, in general, a resource that um, you should um, subscribe to when you are doing cloud native uh, development. And what I want to highlight are two blog posts about uh, tracing with ASP.NET, with Jaeger, and Thai. Um, if you have not heard about Thai, Thai is an .NET tool. It's in experimental status, so it's not, not even in preview, but it really helps you with um, developing microservices, um, building microservices, um, managing microservices, testing them, of course, also. Um, it's really a super cool framework tool. Um, and these two blog posts show you how you can bring the things together when it comes to distributed tracing, which is also, I think, quite one of the, the most important topics when it comes to developing microservices. Then, um, yeah, jumping back to uh, local development with Microsoft, there is one announcement um, about a webinar um, or a webinar series about local development, and that's interesting in the area of IoT. Now, um, this blog post or this webinar series, I think, um, really shows how you can bring the best of all the worlds together from Azure and the Power Platform. So it's not just plumbing together the IoT service of Azure with the Power Platform, but it really shows you on a real life scenario how you can benefit from the Azure IoT services in conjunction with uh, Azure Functions and the local approach of the Power Platform and how you can benefit benefit from there in IoT scenarios. So that's that's really an interesting setup, and I think that's really helpful because, especially with with IoT topics, you do not want to spend a lot of time in areas that you can cover with local tools. Um, you you have other focus areas within IoT scenarios than that, and I think that really comes in super handy. Now, um, one last blog post from the area of Microsoft about one topic that's gaining more and more traction, and that's Azure Bicep, which is kind of an extraction layer on the Azure Resource Manager templates. And this blog post is really great if you want to start with Bicep. And maybe you have a, a background in ARM, 
because this really shows you what's not working with ARAM. So where do you have um, some, some shortcomings with ARAM and how are they mitigated with BICEP? And um, <clears throat> it really walks you through the basic concepts of BICEP, um, what are the benefits, um, how can how does the language look like? How can you deal with parameters, which is quite important if you do infrastructure as code. And, and this blog post kind of nicely wraps it up. With that, I would like to switch to the uh, yeah, world in between. SAP and Microsoft, how can we bring those two worlds together? And then I want to highlight um, one video podcast of the SAP on Azure series by Holger Brucholt, um, where within the last episode, he um, invited Martin Rappler, who showcases the last blog post that he brought out about authentication flows, principal propagation with um, Microsoft Teams, the Power Platform, and an SAP on-premise system. Now, what's interesting in that scenario is that if you remember all the blog posts by Martin Rappler that I referenced in the past, he always had the business technology platform in between as a, as a mediator for the principal propagation, and that's now left out. So you do not need that one. Um, it's, it's also possible without that, um, making use of custom connectors on the Power Platform and making use of uh, the on-premise data gateway um, by Microsoft on-premise, which allows you to do the principal propagation without the overhead of the SAP Business Technology Platform. So that's why I think that's really worth taking a look at um, this scenario because it simplifies a lot of things. Um, and then there is another uh, general availability announcement um, of a tool that brings both worlds together, namely the Microsoft Teams add-on for business by design. I already um, highlighted that one at the beginning of this year when the beta was announced. And now it's GA. And this is really, from my perspective, how Microsoft and SAP should play together, how you really do a deep integration and add value to your customers. Um, that's, that's really super cool. Um, then let's switch to the area of um, education and yeah, conferences, announcements that come up, events. Um, first of all, if you're starting with um, Kubernetes, if you want to educate yourself on Kubernetes, I have referenced one uh, GIST on that topic um, within the show notes about beginners' resources on Kubernetes, and there are a lot. But that's really a great um, starting point so that you do not have to really start from scratch in that area. Um, it, it's a living GIST, so you can always contribute to that. Um, you can reference sources that you think are worth for, for beginners. So if you start your journey in Kubernetes, take a look at that GIST. Um, then there is an announcement about an upcoming um, SAP community call that takes place on May the 28th with uh, Holger Müller. Uh, Holger Müller, Jürgen Müller today I have. I have it with names, right? Um, and Jürgen Müller, of course, um, of uh, CTO of SAP, um, which takes place on, on Friday, May 28th. And well, it's it's basically the same as the last session in February. It's a Q&A session, so you can bring in your questions and it's completely open for communication with respect to having a moderator that really brings in the question from the community. So let's see how this works out this time. Um, as I said that, uh, there is also now the, the um, agenda now available or the, the sessions are now available for Microsoft Build as well as for SAP Sapphire. So if you have not yet registered yet, you, you should register for those events. And you can now also um, build your agenda for both events, they, they came out, I think, this week on, on Wednesday and Thursday. And then if you want to do a talk yourself, um, there is one thing that I stumbled across and that's um, everyone can contribute, um, which is kind of a format that um, offers you uh, live sessions where you can demo or showcase what you learned, if you have an open source project or if you have if you want to try a new technology in a live pair programming session, that's kind of not for beginners, I guess. 
but um, that there, there are a lot of options that you have there, and it's every Wednesday mm -hmm. at um, 6 p.m. And you can, can contribute there if, if you want to. So you can um, bring in your own talks, and if they're accepted, yeah, you have something um, where you can present your, your stuff. That's, I think, a really cool community format. I didn't know about that one. It's, it's not really brand new, but maybe you also didn't know, so now we all know. With that, um, I would like to switch to the last section of this session, and that's about uh, developer productivity. There is one thing um, that came out with GitHub, and that's, I think, really useful, and that's a copy button for um, code sections within the GitHub repository. So if you are watching this, I will now shortly switch to one GitHub repository that I mentioned before. So as you can see here, we, we have these this, uh, code blocks. And as you can see here, we have here the copy button. So you can now really copy all the code out um, without having any problems with uh, empty spaces or something like that. That usually happen when you copy that uh, cool feature by um, then there is another tool that I, I would like to highlight, um, and that's Code Tool Watch. Um, if you're working with code tools, so tools through your code within your um, 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 VS Code projects, um, you might have come into the, the situation that you change the code, but you forget to, um, to uh, adopt the tool file. Which will then break the tool fall probably, um, or you have a community project where uh, some some folks contribute, and they do do uh, contributions to your code, which will break your tool falls. And this GitHub action that is available here, um, yeah, highlights that if there is the the danger of uh, changes within the the source code file that is also referenced within a, a code tool file. So I think that's that's really helpful. And then, last topic for today, um, a tool that's not brand new, but was recently rewritten in Go, and that's um, Cube Context and Cube NS. That's really power tools add-ons for uh, kubectl, or kubectl, or however you want to call it, um, that allow you to switch between clusters, so between contexts, and between namespaces. So if you're working in the Kubernetes area and, and have to switch a lot between different clusters and within the clusters between different namespaces, these tools um, really come in handy. So you, you should definitely uh, take a look at them because they make your life easier. And that's what we all need as developers, right? Yeah, with that, I'm at the end of today's session of my news wrap. I hope I had some interesting news for you. I hope I had some new stuff for you, some Things that you would like to dig into, I would say Azure Static Web Apps is definitely one of them. Um, and with that, I wish you a nice Friday, a nice weekend, and see you next Friday. Until then, goodbye.